we walk all the way here like these shoes were comfortable. Okay, God, God bless everybody. All right, um, welcome everybody. This is a good looking room. Y'all don't think so? Okay. <laughs> this is a great event. I'm so happy to be here at uh, a summit that welcomes and, and unites African countries. But y'all y'all heard I'm Nigerian American, right? So I'm I'm be a little rowdy. Where are my Nigerians at? In Ibokwenu. Hey, okay, we're there for this place. No shaking. Okay. Uh, I can start the protocol. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Innovators Gathering hosted by the US Department of State, Prosper Africa, and the Tony Elumelu Foundation with the support from Google. Yes, let's clap it up. I personally am thrilled to be here in this room with so many influencers, influential people, innovators, and it is really a pleasure to be your MC, for real. Um, we have an inspiring and exciting event ahead of us, a couple of days of events ahead of us, and a big night to kick off a historic week full of events, bringing people and governments together from across the African nations, and it's not the World Cup, guys, it's this. <laughs> We will pray for the super egos. One day they will be super again. Um, <laughs> what? I said it. <laughs> Africa is truly a continent on the move as home to the world's largest free trade area, growing economics, and an increasingly young, urban, and digitally connected population. The continent offers tremendous opportunities for growth on both sides of the Atlantic, and we are seeing an emergence of hometown African businesses, particularly in the tech sector, and these companies are the drivers of growth in Africa. It, it makes me proud as a Nigerian American in America to see all of the young people, all of the innovation. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy because when I go back to Lagos, I'm like, ah, I know we have enough engineers <laughs> to give us electricity full time. <laughs> I know they all went to MIT. They all went to MIT. I know they are here. So I, I'm excited for this gathering because the change is on the horizon and the people who are here that can make the change are here to listen to how the change can occur and empower the change to happen on all fronts. Um, personal, just sorry about me for some of y'all who are like, who is this girl with the big hair and this bright suit? Um, <laughs> I'm cute though. Um, <laughs> I'm a Potaka girl. I was born in Potaka, Nigeria. Uh, my parents immigrated to uh, the Maryland area, the DMV, actually, when there was a nursing shortage in the U.S. And my mom was a nurse at Howard University Hospital for 27 years. H-U, yes. I went to the George Washington University uh, down, the, down the road. Uh, I, as most Nigerians, I was supposed to be a doctor. My parents are still brain. They are still brain. Um, and after I got my master's degree, because that's what you have to do, I decided I wanted to tell jokes for a living, to which my parents, uh, you know, God bless them. <laughs> they are still concerned, but it's worked out. Okay, so now they can say, ah, oh, our daughter is on television. Have you seen her? Have you seen? No, that is our daughter. Yes. It wasn't always like that. Um, but I know that this room is full, of, full with entrepreneurs, a lot of y'all with multiple degrees that you are no longer using. Mm. <laughs> but that is the power of the strength of Africa within our bones, right? No matter what, we will surpass all adversity. You know, I came to Hollywood with no connections, with, I mean, no connections. Uh, when I started doing comedy, there were no females uh, Nigerian African females like myself who were trying to break into the industry and in seven years um, I have not only brought HBO cameras to the village, not Lagos, not Potaco, but to the village um, to capture content for the American audience um, and also just let people know that our stories are valid, our stories are worthy to be told. <laughs> Our stories are not just ones of poverty. Our stories are, are, are magnificent. This room is filled with lots of money, <laughs> lots, of, lots of very successful individuals. And I think it's time to rewrite the narrative of Africa. 
I think it's time to rewrite the narrative of what's possible in Africa. Y'all, there's, there's lots to do on the continent, and this is the room, this is the summit that will do all of those things. And so it brings me great pleasure to be here and serve as your MC. And without any further ado, I will introduce to the stage Dorothy McAuliffe, State, State Special Rep for Global Partnerships. Please come to the stage. I know what you mean about the walk, Yvonne. It's a long one. Okay, so good, good evening. Welcome to the United States State Department. We're so honored to have you all here. And on behalf of Secretary Antony Blinken, Department of State and Prosper Africa, thank you so much for joining us for this exciting event tonight to honor innovation in Africa. As the special rep for the Office of Global Partnerships, one of our key priorities is developing partnerships with African countries, companies, and NGOs to elevate and accelerate the innovative and entrepreneurial work being done across the continent. I recently returned from a trip to Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and COP27 in Egypt. So who's in the house from Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire? Yay! <laughs> Um, and there I met with entrepreneurs and saw the impressive and impact of the, their work firsthand, including innovations that can improve the effic efficiency of our global supply chains and cold chain management, addressing some of the key challenges we face around key, uh, food insecurity and vaccine distribution. And tonight, it is my honor to lead a panel uh, discussion on entrepreneurial innovation and the power of investing in Africa. But before we get into the panel, we have a surprise special guest who sent in a video to say hello and to recognize the important work of this gathering. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank Secretary Blinken, the Prosper Africa Initiative, the Tony Alamello Foundation, and Google for bringing this group together. And I want to recognize all the young innovators who are here tonight. When I hosted the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit back in 2014, I made a commitment to invest in the next generation of African leaders and give them the support they need to make their dreams a reality. My message to Africa's young people remains the same today. When you succeed, your country succeed, and that creates more opportunities for everyone. Right now, the median age of people living in Africa is 19 years old. Africa advancing new solutions to old challenges, and influencing global culture like never before. And U.S. businesses are taking notice. Over the last five years, U.S. investors have closed more than 500 deals in Africa, totaling about $30 billion. They've done it because they believe in Africa's boundless human capacity. And it's especially impressive when you consider the what it is today just a few years ago. If all of us up our game, this will only be the beginning. That's why the U.S. government is partnering with businesses and investors to connect people and industries in the U.S. and Africa. They're helping companies build out their supply chains and mobilize investment that will strengthen African markets and help combat the climate crisis. But business doesn't operate in a vacuum. You also need responsive governments, stable institutions, and potential customers with money to spend. That's why I'm glad that many organizations, including the Obama Foundation, are also supporting all kinds of young leaders across the continent. Not just entrepreneurs, but leaders in civil society and the public sector as well. All of us will keep doing everything we can to help you succeed. And my hope is that when you do succeed, you'll use your power to help address some of the biggest challenges of our time from climate change to global health to food security. I know some of you already are, and I hope you use this gathering as an opportunity to build the connections you need to do even more. So congratulations on everything you've accomplished. And to anyone looking for investment opportunities, I encourage you to look to Africa, because something special is happening there. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the evening. That's a great way to kick off. Um, first, I want to. I want to. Um, I'm going to just uh, 
introduce our panelists. And so if they will come up as I call your name, please, as I do your introduction, that would be wonderful. First person I'd like to call to the stage, very special person, Awela Alumalu. Dr. Alumalu is the co-founder co of the Tony Alumalu Foundation, which is which is co-sponsoring this event. Dr. Alumalu is a leading voice in empowering a new generation of African entrepreneurs, driving poverty eradication, ensuring job creation, and fighting for the rights of Africans, women, and children. And next, we have Kome Mwiti. Please come to the stage. Kome is a Kenyan entrepreneur and founder of Tiny.Africa, a payment processor that facilitates mobile wallet transactions at the lowest cost. Tiny.Africa is a platform that allows businesses, charities, students, designers, and anyone else to receive funds from their website, app, or social media. And finally, please welcome in Kim Akocha. In Kim is the founder of Mama Money, which supports low-income and underserved young female entrepreneurs in rural and urban regions across Nigeria with microloans, digital skills, financial literacy, skill-based business training to support their business. And through the smartphone app, Mama Money offers women fast and low-interest loans that enable them to build, grow, and sustain their businesses. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we're going to get, we have mics. Hello? Hello? Okay, great. So I want to thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining this panel. So let's get started. Tonight's uh, event is Investing in U.S. Africa Cultural and Economic Partnerships. And I'd like, so I'd like to ask our panelists some questions to explore the impact of investing in entrepreneurs across Africa. And my first question is for Dr. Alumalu. Why are young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship in general so important to you and the, and the work you're doing? Okay, so thank you very much for having me here, for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be here. I'm happy to be part of this. Very resp I'm grateful for the what the Biden administration is doing, or is committing to doing. So I am, as you said, so I'm, one, I'm a co-founder of the Tony Alumali Foundation, and our primary focus, primary aim, is to empower entrepreneurs. And you ask why are they important to us? So as we all know, the, the, the future of, of the world, really, and of Africa is in the hands of the youth. And we in the Tony Elevelli Foundation have chosen to focus on entrepreneurs because we believe that if we can empower the entrepreneurs, if we can empower the young ones, then we are sure of you know, dealing with a lot of the problems of society. We're sure of helping to eradicate poverty. We're sure of helping to even develop, we, because we believe not apart, apart from the entrepreneurs, we're increasing female inclusion. So we do all these things because we know that if we develop the entrepreneurs, if we grow the entrepreneurs, we improve development in the society. And you know, with that, we can help to grow the economy, both socially and you know, financially. So this is why we do this in the Tony Lomelo Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate your, your words. And so now to our entrepreneurs, Kome and Enkem. We've just heard a little bit about the impactful work that you both do, and we'd like to know what types of support do entrepreneurs like you really need to scale your businesses to the next level? Kome, you want to go first? Um, thank you so much for the question, Dorothy. Uh, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll, uh, give by, I'll start by giving an example of uh, maybe an entrepreneur in Africa so we have a small trader who sells uh, sausages uh, and it's a street vending business and uh, a sausage is being sold for 30 cents of a dollar. Uh, if you think about uh, that kind of journey, this person gets paid through the advancement of mobile wallet technology in Africa and they're getting paid from that and for every transaction they're charged at transaction costs of uh, 0.5% to, to about 5%. Uh, 
uh, which means after every five sausages, basically they're giving a sausage for free. Uh, this vendor has a family. Any emergency cripples the business. So if you think about it, uh, what we do with the tiny pesa, which is tiny Africa, we basically charge just a small monthly uh, cost. The support that we've gotten uh, from uh, the Tony Alumelo Foundation uh, started uh, way back when they believed in us, and that support and mentorship has taken us a long way. And uh, like, for example, my first bank account for my business was actually through UBA Bank, and it also came through the foundation. So I think the most important thing is the journey, because it's really easy to give up, but then that journey, and you have a foundation that just believes in you, uh, takes you all the way, and uh, we, I would say that we are able to supply and support those young vendors and uh, small-scale traders who are numbering probably to about 44 million traders in sub-Saharan Africa. So those numbers are huge if you think of all those uh, issues that they experience with uh, the high costs in transactions with the advancement of mobile technology. So our work is to gap, bridge the gap between online and offline payments uh, to just enable those people to access customers who they will never access before and grow their business. So, yeah. So I heard two things. I heard investment capital and I heard mentorship as support uh, as well. So thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kome. In Kim, what can you say about what do you think it, it takes to scale for entrepreneurs? Okay, thanks for having me. In 2015, I had this idea of funding low-income female entrepreneurs like my mother. My mother is a widow who run micro-enterprises. Most of these women cannot access funding from banks because their team does high risk. They do not have collateral. And I wanted to fund them. I wanted to start a company that would fund them. But I did not have the business skills until I met the Tony Lumilu Foundation. So the foundation helped with the business trainings, they got me a mentor who had over 25 years experience in the financial service sector. They, they, they provided trainings for me. Like Kome shared, my first corporate account, they, they actually told us that for people to take you seriously, you need to have like a proper business account. So our first corporate account was from United Bank of Africa, that's UBA. So for me, business training, they gave me that support. They, they taught me how to put structure in my business. Um, and recently, um, they walked me through. They've been there from the start. So they are like family. Since I started, they are always in touch with me. And recently, they are like, OK, Mama Money, we, we, uh, we have another training for you. That's this year. And with the training that they gave to us, because they didn't just look at, okay, we've trained you in 2015. With the continuous training, this year, uh, we were accelerated through um, Seed Stars, sponsored by the foundation. And we introduced a new service. And that service helped us create 100 employment for women who do not have jobs in Nigeria. So for me, the business training is very key. That's what we got from the foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenkin. And Dr. Alumalu, one of the most surprising statistics um, that we come across is that nearly 60% of entrepreneurs in Africa are women-owned. Despite that, we know that women-owned businesses face an acute lack of funding and support. Um, and how, how do you see a way for us to continue to tackle this challenge? Indeed, we, I mean, as we all know, we need to include, we need to, um, to do more for women in Africa. As a foundation, this has always been a focus for us. I mean, I'll take us back a bit. When we started in the foundation, we only had about 20% of our entrepreneurs being women. But because we recognize the importance of women, because we recognize that, you know, if you empower a woman, you're empowering a whole society, we made a conscious effort to bring in more women. And really, last year, about 70% of our entrepreneurs were women. So, I mean, this is, it's important so that the women feel that they have the support and they're not alone. But more importantly, you know, you ask, what can we do? It's, it's, it's partnership again. We were able to do this last year because we had a number of partners who were 
who came on board with us to empower more women. I mean, we have Google here. They were a big partner last year. We have the EU. And so we had all these people who came and you know, committed to empowering more women, making it possible to, to, to give more, to do more for the women, really. And so that's, that's one big thing, because we had, the more people we have joining hands to empower women, the more. The, the foundation is equipped. The foundation has done this all. It's tried, it's tested. But then with the help of all these partners, we're able to do more for women and to, you know, to bring up more women and to empower more women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Komei and Inkim, as uh, Tony Alumalu um, entrepreneurs, you talked a, about the support that you've received from the foundation and how it's affected your businesses positively. Uh, you're here. Uh, we appreciate you being here at, um, at the State Department, and we have other agencies here from the federal government of the United States here. Uh, th thinking about an olive government approach, what can we what can we take back um, as the United States government? Lessons learned from what you have uh, derived to support the the lessons from uh, your work with the foundation. Um, it's uh, an interesting question because uh, I actually met Kim in 2015 also, and uh, we were talking about this. Uh, just uh, yesterday, and uh, what we are, I noticed is the follow-up, uh, it looks small, but uh, the follow-up uh, in emails, uh, the follow-up uh, seeing other success stories of other entrepreneurs uh, gives you that uh, motivation to continue. And uh, the one thing that uh, I think uh, the U.S. government and uh, maybe other government agencies can do over time is just uh, keep following up and uh, not have uh, maybe like a one-time kind of uh, thing. It's not only about the money, it's also about uh, its mentorship, it's uh, the follow-up, it's uh, more like the connection, connecting to other entrepreneurs so that you can be able to see what they are doing and what you are doing and compare yourself and also motivate each other. So the networks I've built over that period, I have uh, a lot of people following me just waiting to see what I'm doing next and then they'll be asking questions and I'll be advising them and someone will be like, you have really good advice. In my mind, I'm like, it's just advice I have, <laughs> you know, it's just normal. But uh, I think that follow-up is one of the biggest uh, support uh, systems that you can have and connections to other entrepreneurs over time. So I think that's something that can be improved on and uh, it's continuous. It never stops. Good advice. Thank you. And Kim, do you have thoughts on that question? Okay, so for me, um, I want the U.S. government to um, work with foundations like the Tony Lovello Foundation um, to partner with them because we can see at scale that they genuinely care about young Africans, giving them a chance because they took a chance on me. So working with partners like the Tony Lovello Foundation that would drive the impact we want to see in Africa is very, very key. So unlike commercial, not just funding, helping to implement policies that would drive change, that would impact Africa, because we have a lot of challenges when it comes to illegal migration that needs to be tackled. We have um, poverty in Africa. So working with foundations like the Tony Lumilo Foundation can, can really help um, um, scale the impact of um, um, job employment in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a question for all three of you. Another question. Based on your experiences, why must it be a global priority for all stakeholders to collectively invest in African entrepreneurs? And I think this gets a little bit to what you're saying. It's not just business. It's not just government, not just NGOs, but kind of all of us together. Um, so, Dr. Olumalu, would you have, want to start with that? Yes, definitely. I mean, so there's something that um, we always like to say. You ask why it should be a global priority. So, you know, we always like to say that poverty anywhere is a threat to mankind everywhere. And we really strongly believe this in the foundation. And so we believe that we need to all be involved and this is why, I mean, I talk about partnership, and they've talked about, talk about partnership, and really, partnership is that's why we're here. So we, we, we know that we must come together to, to help to 
build up the entrepreneurs. You know, one thing that comes to mind as I talk, think I'm talk about partnership is the philosophy we believe in and we hold dearly and strongly to in the foundation. This is the philosophy of Afri-capitalism. And Kem talked about government. Yes, indeed, government. But in, in, in the foundation, we strongly believe that the private sector has a strong, a big role to play in development. We know governments are important extremely, but the government can't do it alone. And so we believe that we need the private sector. Everyone has to come on board to help to develop, to help to build up this, these entrepreneurship, these entrepreneurs, sorry, who we know, who we believe so much in, who we know that if we can build them up, we're talking about eradicating poverty. We're talking about, you know, building economies. We're talking about social growth, political growth, financial growth. So we know that if we bring on board more private sector partners and players, we'll form strong partnerships and, um, and we will be able to do this together. Thank you. Kome, did you want to add something to that, please? Um. I, of course, I concur with everything uh, the doctor has said, but uh, I also wanted to add uh, the ecosystem really also involves the uh, society at large because so many times uh, you build a product and then you find yourself, like uh, someone mentioned, uh, it's, it does not work in a vacuum. It actually works in, a, in a, an entire ecosystem where you have uh, the private uh, public partnership, you know, you have your government, you have uh, your society, but also it's uh, that connection communicating the value of what you are trying to do so that you can be able to loop all these guys into one thing and they communicate in one, in one direction because uh, if you have diverse views where people are not uh, in the loop, it's like uh, you are working alone. So that ecosystem is so important uh, of all those partnerships plus the society. And then now you can grow something uh, organically. It, and uh, I guess that's the only thing I can add. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. And Cam? OK, just like I shared earlier, um, and Dr. Aweli said that poverty and you is a threat to us all everywhere. So for me, um, I think, like I shared earlier, government, um, the U.S. government, um, our government, private um, sector need to take it as a very urgent global issue because when it comes to unemployment in Africa, um, the people that will help create jobs for these people are young African entrepreneurs. So investing in these entrepreneurs is very, very key. Like I shared earlier, just because of a training and funding we got in partnership um, um, sponsored by the foundation with the European Union, I was able to create jobs for 100 women who had no jobs. And these women now have funds to feed and educate their children. And they've done transaction what? They've, they've done transaction in four months worth over $2 million. These are women sitting down idle in their homes. So it's very, very key. When you invest in African entrepreneurs, young African entrepreneurs, they go on to create jobs that can reduce poverty in our communities. Thank you. So um, our time is almost at an end, but I'd love for Dr. Olumalu to close us out with some closing thoughts um, about what the future looks like for young African entrepreneurs in this moment in time. What do you see? So for young African entrepreneurs, you know, this, the world is um, at an interesting place now, and entrepreneurs will not be left out and cannot be left out. So I see entrepreneurs, you know, playing a bigger role in, um, you know, climate, in sustainability, definitely, because this is, it's, 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 we're all responsible. We all have to play our part, play a role. Another one would be technology. So I know we're almost out of time, but then technology is so key. At the foundation, we have, we had, we realized that we couldn't, skip. there's so many, there's, the need out there is so great. And we realized that we needed technology to scale. And so we have this platform called the TEF Connect. And with this, we've been able to reach millions of entrepreneurs to help to train them, to develop them. And so I think technology is key. 
for entrepreneurs because not only has this helped us to reach the entrepreneurs, it had to it helps the first the entrepreneurs to be able to to, to adopt technology and to become more technologically savvy because it's the way of the future. So we see this improving and increasing. And then very quickly, I just want to talk about healthcare because that's my area. I'm very keen to see, you know, entrepreneurs. I'm eager to see, you know, the developments in innovation in healthcare. I believe there'll be lots of innovation in the healthcare space and of course in all other spaces. So really that's, that would be me for entrepreneurs in the future. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to close down this panel, although I would love to hear you all talk uh, into the evening, and we'll have another chance upstairs. Um, but I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and your insights and your experiences uh, with all of us and for helping us come away inspired to go into these next few days and really have some really meaningful conversations about what the next steps are, what the action is. And uh, I can't think of a better way to have kicked off this week than to have you all here. And so I thank you very, very much for, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you to our amazing panelists. In Kim, I already know you mean business. Anytime an African woman says, okay, like I said before, <laughs> until you are not, are you not getting? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right. <laughs> All right we are going to keep the, the program moving. Next, I want to uh, introduce the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's U.S. Africa Business Center, um, who will be the start of our, um, our pitch competition. So coming to the stage, please welcome Rivera Yao. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really, really honored to be here representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm actually very delighted to have the opportunity to introduce three amazing uh, entrepreneurs from the continent uh, that just arrived yesterday. Uh, they will be here to introduce and to present the innovation that they, they have. Um, and. Uh, I also want to say that uh, uh, this uh, annual competition that we have at the U.S. Chamber uh, is held with the U.S. Africa Development Foundation uh, and American Chamber of Commerce across the continent. Uh, and the aim is really to spotlight um, entrepreneurs' innovation on the continent uh, and to see how we could support them and make more impact. Uh, in the world. But before I, we hear about these finalists, amazing finalists, uh, as they make uh, the pitch, I would like to take a moment uh, to recognize our sponsor partners. Uh, we have Prosper Africa, part of uh, the, the, the partners. We have Voice of America. We have Sebastian, Microsoft, Amazon Web Service, Trimble, American Tower Corporation, Vista Bank, Standard Bank, Cosmos Innovation Center, KPMG, uh, from all the way from Nigeria. So it's, it's really uh, amazing. I also want to note that those three startups that you see here today are selected from close to 2,000, 2,000 startups across 50 African countries. Uh, so they are actually quite amazing. And uh, uh, when you step back, you could actually sense that those startups truly embody the connection between digital innovation and impact uh, results, uh, and also how to, to really uh, connect uh, the informal sector, because that's exactly what uh, they, they're doing, how to empower smallhold farmers, uh, and also how uh, to, to make sure that uh, they provide life-saving uh, medicine uh, for healthcare. So uh, I think now it is time to hear directly from our finalists, uh, after which all of you in this room will be required uh, to actually uh, choose through a voting process to choose who do you think is the most compelling, the most innovative, in the most 
impactful and the most scalable uh, uh, venture that you see uh, from them. So uh, I also like to tell you that uh, we will ask you to be ready with your phone. Uh, there will be a QR code that you could scan and, and be able to make uh, uh, your voting. Fortunately, I have to remind our U.S. government and uh, chamber staff that we are not allowed to, to, to vote. You cannot be judge and party at the same time. Uh, so we, we are excluded. Uh, but people on, on the screen are really encouraged to, to, to use the, uh, the QR code because uh, this is streamed uh, directly so they are able to, to see that. I spoke about three amazing entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, one of them uh, was not able to make it because he had some flight issues. As he was coming here, uh, somebody got sick. They have to take them straight to a Canary Island. And he was supposed to be here at 1 o'clock. Now he's going to be here at 7. Uh, so, but he has a video that he was able to, to project, I mean, to make uh, in between tra transit. Uh, so we're going to hear immediately uh, from, from that. And then after that, I'll go uh, one by one uh, with our innovator, the two innovators that we have in the room. Uh, so can we proceed with the, the first one? Hi, sorry I couldn't join you in DC. My name is Frank, presenting for Shopper. For so many years, Africans' economy has been thriving because of the informal sector. About 70% of trade in Africa goes to the informal sector. However, the sector faces two main challenges, access to inventory and working capital. Mostly women, these retailers are responsible for sourcing inventory themselves. The process involves closing their shop, picking a car to the market, roaming for hours looking for products at best prices and transport back to their shops. They are also unable to access credit facilities to grow their business. Our platform allows these women or shops to be able to source inventory directly from suppliers and have it delivered to their shop within four hours. We also give them access to working capital financing and also other financial services to grow their business. Since we launched in 2021, We've grown from zero customers to over 3,400 customers, and we've done a total transaction of $1.6 million and still growing 30% month on month. With the introduction of our credit, we've seen a retailer move from a very small shop to a medium shop. An example is Antia Joa, who started transacting with us in 2021. She started with a $11 order on a weekly basis. But since we introduced the credit, she's been able to move from that $11 to $150 order size per week. For us, this is the impact we want to see in the lives of these retailers. Because most of them are limited with working capital, we also give them access to group buying, where retailers come together and then buy a, a, a particular goods and then share among themselves. We are currently rolling out our SaaS product in partnership with Abenbev in the Ghanaian market to enable these retailers have access to inventory easier and faster. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was Frank Nana Ade from uh, Shopa, uh, Ghana. Uh, and uh, I think we wish him the best. I think he's going to be here very soon. Uh, that shows the resilience of <laughs> somebody was talking about this. Now, I would like to move to our second uh, contestant. Her name is Miss Ore Alemede. She's a co-founder of Grow Agric. Grow Agric uh, is, a, is an ag tech startup uh, working extremely hard uh, in Kenya uh, to, to support small farmers. So we're going to give her the floor. She will have about two minutes. This is exactly what Frank did two minutes to speak about her innovation, how impactful the innovation is, and uh, so she has that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me with a mic? Great. My name is Ore, and I'm the CEO of Grow Greek. Grow Greek is a farmer's first agriculture technology company based out of Kenya that provides small-scale farmers with working capital finance, insurance, training, farm management tools, and connection to buyers. 
we aim to optimize the entire agriculture value chain for our farmers. We're powered by technology, so on our app, our farmers are not only able to access the services, but they are also able to add their records. And by adding their records, we provide them with easy to understand dashboard that helps them make better decisions about themselves and their farm. Gregg is not only farmer first, we also refer to ourselves as an agriculture technology by farmers for farmers, because the founding team is made up of farmers. And that is what makes us unique. Our strength is the partnership we have with our farmers. Our business model is such that if our farmers don't make a profit, we don't make a profit. They have to win for us to win, and that's what makes us unique. In the last two years that we have been existing, we've been able to empower over 2,500 farmers. Um, every farmer we work with, gets to we get to increase their revenue by $750. That might not sound like a lot, but every farmer we work with used to make 1,500. So we provide 50% increase in revenue for them. We've also been able to increase our farmers' productivity by an average of 70%. We've found that our livestock farmers have experienced mortality rate of 3% compared to market average of 10%. For us to be able to feed the food gap, we need to not only increase productivity, but we need to decrease mortality, and that's what we do. We're also very intentional. Over 65% of our farmers are women. Over 70% are youth. We've also created thousands of jobs, and we're super amazed and proud of where we are today. But where I would like to be is in five years from now, when I stand in front of you again, I want to be in a position to tell you that Gora Greek has been able to empower 800,000 farmers in the last five years. And the way we're going to do that is through our technology offering. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ori. Uh, we are not done. We still have one more. Uh, so we, we, uh, I, I would like to call now Mr. Tunde. Uh, Mr. Tunde is a co-founder and CEO of Health Botics, uh, a startup that is specialized on uh, you know, bringing technology to, to, to healthcare, uh, providing access uh, to, to healthcare. So, without further ado. Please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tunde Oyebamiji. I'm a medical doctor and the co founder of Health Botics Limited, the creators of Lendanum. Let me tell you a story. In Africa, 60% of patients receive healthcare in rural areas. Yet, 83% of the time, they went to the rural hospitals to get care. Hospitals don't have access to essential supplies like medication, blood, and even oxygen. 83% of care encounters by Africans ended up in we don't have. This is a big problem. This problem kills people. It killed my sister in 2011. Every single day in Nigeria, 145 pregnant women and 6,000 children with severe anemia die because they could not get a blood transfusion. While essential supplies goes to waste in urban centers, rural areas routinely face stockouts and patient suffers. To this, Lendanam is fixing this problem. We are using technology, mobile application, 24 seven call center, and an autonomous flying vehicles to connect rural, rural hospitals to suppliers of essential medications, and we deliver to them right at their doorstep. Since we began commercial operation about 18 months ago, We've, we've assisted the movement of over 8,000 essential medical supplies, and we've made over $105,000 in revenue and attained profitability just within 10 months. Our business model is simple. We charge a 5% commission on the value of the entire cart, and also we have an inventory management software that we charge $35 for per month. As at the moment, we serve a, a network of over 109 hospitals in rural areas. We also facilitate over 800,000 care encounters per year. Our vision is to keep on doing what we're doing, serve 10,000 hospitals across Africa, and try to deliver at least 1,000 essential medical supply by 2020. And more importantly, prevent avoidable death, like my sister. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard from these three amazing uh, entrepreneurs, you could see why it was difficult for us. Uh, it's extremely close. Uh, so you are actually required this time to 
take the QR code, uh, scan, and we're just opening the voting now. You have about 10 minutes to vote, after which we're just going to close. Uh, the result will be announced uh, later upstairs today. Thank you very much. I don't know about y'all, but I am here for African Shark Tank. I love that. <laughs> it's very passionate and emboldened. It's amazing. All right, so hopefully you guys are able to connect your phones to the QR code. Um, if not, can they? Can y'all see it from back there? Yes. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. All right, we're gonna keep it moving. All right. While you all are thinking over who will be the next contestant on Products Are Right. Um, <laughs> I am going to introduce someone that we all know. I'm, it brings me great pleasure to introduce this individual. You know him as an actor. You know him as a writer. You even know him as a DJ. But today, yeah, y'all know who I'm talking about. All right. Uh, okay, okay, everyone, calm down. Uh, I'm somebody too, you know. <laughs> but today he is here as an investor who is investing in the entrepreneurs from farms to film. Let us please welcome Mr. Idris Elba. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, let me just thank all of the sponsors to put this incredible event together. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, very proud to be amongst all of us. There's one thing we all have in common is that we would love to see uh, a better day for Africa in the future. There's one thing that we have heard over and over again in the wonderful discussion earlier is that investment into our youth is the way forward. If there are any investors that are listening and watching today, if you do not consider Africa as a viable investment. You are not considering yourself or your future. Africa's future is your own future and vice versa. You know, I've, as an actor, I guess, you know, my uh, skill set, my superhero is my voice and my, my voice box and the bandwidth that I'm allowed to use it. I was born and raised in East London. I'm very proud of that. My parents come from Sierra Leone and Ghana. Howdy, buddy, Kushe. Any Ghanaians here? It's a sir. I grew up knowing my culture, understanding my culture. But I also grew up in, in, in London where being African was something to be ashamed of. They made me feel small. They took the, you know, joy out of my dark skin. They, you know, made me want to pretend to be West Indian, in fact. So when I grew up and I got to a place where suddenly my dark skin was being applauded and shined and loved and shared and ad admired, I realized that I can only give all of that to Africa, to where my parents came from. My parents left their villages to go to the big city uh, to create dreams for themselves. But one day they hoped to go back to the village. They didn't go back to the village. They stayed. They stayed in England. I managed to go back to their village. I'm still going back to the village. I'm carrying the dreams they took to London. I'm taking them to our village. And basically, my parents invested their dreams in me as a youth. So that is essentially the metaphor of what we are doing when we consider Africa's investment, when we consider investing in innovation. We've just seen from the most incredible panelists today that how innovators are not just thinking about money. They're thinking about social structures, social help. They're trying different things to help each other, okay? Farming is not sexy. 
okay? But it is necessary. We all eat from farmers. And farming needs innovation. Healthcare is not sexy. We don't like the idea of someone suffering and not being able to get medicine, but I'm thankful for Tunde and his innovation to try and figure out a way. And that's something that we all have to remind ourselves that that is the absolute um, opportunity with Africa. We do not need aid anymore. We need innovation. We need... We need partnership. When you look at this incredible board of sponsorships, that is what partnership in Africa looks like. And that's what it should look like for the future. I'm talking from the heart. I should have prepared a speech. <laughs> but when it, talk, when it comes to Africa, you know, it, it is my heart. So I can speak about it all day. Um, my film industry in Africa creates five billion dollars a year okay that's incredible but yet it's still underserved and the reason why it's important for us to serve the film industry is because it is a window into africa it is also a mirror of ourselves okay so that's why it's important to that if we want to change the narrative we spend a little money in our media our films, our narrative, our storytellers, our creators. Because that is the way we change the narrative. Every other developed nation in the world has used film and television, books, media and magazines to change their narrative. Not just to the world, but inwardly. So it's important that we grasp onto that notion as well. I just want to again thank the sponsors for tonight. Thank you all for... Um, coming here and, and, and paying such attention. Um, I'm very thankful. By the way, I know who I'm going to vote for. <laughs> Watch the space. You didn't need a speech. We, that was from the heart. We got it. And I, I love that you, you, you said that it was your, your voice that was your superpower. That's what everyone else was thinking. It was your voice. Yeah, the whole, yeah, oh my God, it was his voice. Yes, it was, yes, As, I, yeah, it was definitely his voice. But if you take nothing else from what Mr. Elba said, we do not need aid. We do not need aid in Africa. We need innovation and we need partnerships. That, that's all you had to say, brother. That was fa fantastic. Um, and so please vote. And we, uh, while you're voting, we will then move this procession um, to the reception area. I'm, I'm pointing there because it feels like that's the only exit. <laughs> so we're going to go that way, y'all. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our amazing panelists, to our innovators. See you guys upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>